Okay. I think most people have been assigned now, so I think we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to those of you who have just joined us for this session. My name is John Trier. I'm a research fellow here at Bickel, and I'm delighted to be chairing this panel on the role of NGOs in international law. Unfortunately, our first set of presenters for this panel were unable to make the workshop today due to a class that came up at relatively short notice. So in the end, we'll only have three presentations for this panel, but that will hopefully give us a bit more time for any discussions at the end. In terms of the theme of this panel, the presentations will be looking at how NGOs engage with international law in a very broad range of contexts. So starting with efforts among NGOs to establish international criminal responsibility, in the context of the Russo-Ukrainian war, then moving to the role of NGOs in shaping discussions around investor state dispute settlement within the UN Commission of International Trade Law, Working Group 3, and finishing with a presentation on the contributions of the International Chamber of Commerce to the regulation of international trade finance. So, as you can see, we'll be covering a vast terrain of international law in the next hour and a half or so, and I'm sure this will give rise to some really fascinating conversations. Before we get started on these, just to say a few quick words about the format of the panel. So each speaker will have approximately 15 minutes to present. I think we can be a little more lenient here, uh, given that we only have three presentations for the current panel, but I'll still interject around the 16 minute mark if it seems like the presentation is likely to overrun significantly, just to make sure that we still have some time for discussion at the end. And a few points on that. We'll hear all three presentations first before moving on to the Q&A, which we should have about half an hour for. If you do have a question, please either write it in the chat together with the name of the panellist or the panellist it's aimed at, and I'll collect these and read them out during the Q&A. Alternatively, you can also raise your hand once the presentations have concluded, and I'll call on you to pose your question to the panellists directly. And I would also like to emphasise that the panellists are very warmly invited to ask each other any questions that they may have to help facilitate discussions across the different presentations. I hope that is all clear enough. Um, and if so, without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to our first presenter. Um, so I'm not sure if both presenters are, are present for this for this discussion. Uh, but... It looks now that uh, I am only one, but not okay. Natalia was during previous uh, session, but uh, it was planned that I'm going to present the report. So please don't worry about it. So it's, okay, it's okay, perfect. Perfect. So presenting their paper entitled The Ukrainian NGOs in Establishing Special Tribunal for the Crime of Aggression Initiative, we have Roman Yedeliev, who is an associate professor at Taras Shevchenko National University of Kiev, and who is presenting a paper co-written with uh, Natalia Hendo, who is a research fe fellow at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. So thank you very much for joining us, Roman. Um, please, whenever you're ready, the, the floor is yours. Yeah, dear colleagues, uh, dear organizers, uh, first of all, I'm very grateful for the possibility to share our thoughts uh, on this uh, topic. And thank you for organizing such an important workshop about uh, non-state actors and in international law. It seems to be extremely important topic and I see further development of international law exactly in such uh, non-state actors participation yeah because uh, currently living in a state-centered world yeah we see where we can find ourselves uh, today and uh, that something is wrong and uh, one of such wrong issues of course is an international armed conflict uh, between the russian federation and ukraine uh, as uh, it was uh, said by john uh, my name is roman yedelev i'm an associate professor at taras shevchenko national university of kiev uh, i will present this report uh, on behalf of mine and of my co-author natalia handel who is also uh, a ukrainian legal scholar uh, but currently she serves as a uh, she holds a position uh, of a research fellow at the Geneva Academy of International Humanitarian Law and Human Rights. Our topic is devoted to the participation of non-governmental organizations in the establishment uh, of uh, the special uh, tribunal for the crime of aggression and uh, Generally speaking, yeah, I will limit uh, myself uh, just to the crime of aggression. Uh, 
uh, it was uh, a very difficult task because we speak about uh, international uh, accountability and uh, we look at this issue from the perspective of uh, all four uh, international crimes uh, committed uh, or possibly committed uh, in uh, Russian-Ukrainian uh, war, uh, but uh, we limit ourselves just to one international crime, a crime of uh, because uh, we have, uh, from international legal point of view, yeah, the most difficult task, yeah, how to prosecute uh, leaders of the Russian Federation and possibly the Republic of Belarus for committing this crime of aggression. Yeah, crime of aggression seems to be uh, the less developed, yeah, international uh, crime of current time and uh, uh, such underdevelopment is because we do not have enough of practice on this international crime. And we wanted to look at the issue how NGOs may help us to establish tribunal yeah, and uh, some further steps. I'm sorry that have a presentation, it is still a work in progress, uh, and uh, we do not know in uh, what uh, final form uh, it will uh, get uh, as a result, yeah, because we still do not have a lot of uh, answers uh, to the current questions, uh, especially uh, would such special tribunal be established or not. Yeah, and if it is established, then we have further questions. Yeah, and if it is not established, then we should recognize that uh, we failed uh, in establishing in our efforts to try uh, in our efforts to establish such special tribunal. And of course, it will be a serious problem for international accountability for international crimes. Uh, over the nine year. A international armed uh, conflict between Russia and Ukraine, the perspective of the Ukrainian civil society on the international responsibility of Russia and the individual criminal liability for international crimes has evolved significantly. From the very first days of the international armed conflict, the civil society organizations primarily prioritized human rights protection and legal regulation of the crisis. However, as the conflict escalated, documenting international crimes and submitting evidence to the International Criminal Court became major functions. Such activity was uh, presented by uh, our colleague, uh, Denis Rabomizo during uh, the first uh, panel, and uh, I'm not going to stop on this issue. Just believe me that Ukrainian NGOs were quite effective, quite efficient, and quite successful in providing um, evidence. Uh, but uh, at the same time, you know that uh, the examination of the situation in Ukraine started only the full-scale invasion. Yeah, so since 2014 till 2022, we had only preliminary examination of the situation. And I think that uh, there was no political will to continue to start the yeah, examination of this situation. But the full-scale invasion underscored the need of uh, the need for NGOs to contribute actively to the evolution of international law. This shift is reflected in their work towards establishing a special tribunal for the crime of aggression. Further, I will call it the special tribunal. And our today report is devoted to analyze the efforts of human rights organizations, both Ukrainian and international, but mainly Ukrainian ones, and coalitions of such organizations in promoting the special tribunal and challenges they face in this activity. Our report comprises five parts. So as you understand, we have just a few minutes uh, for each part. Yeah, the first part is cooperation between NGOs. The second uh, part, the dialogue with Ukrainian authorities. The third part, international advocacy efforts. 
the force uh, is devoted to Ukrainian and the international society's awareness and attitudes towards the special tribunal and the NGO's role in such awareness and shaping attitudes. And the last part uh, is about further international legal war of NGOs in establishing the special tribunal. Yeah, for example, participation in drafting the statute or something like that. It should be emphasized that working with each of these groups requires a special approach and uh, will try to show uh, efforts taken and uh, will try to define challenges yeah, NGOs have to overcome. Let's start from the cooperation between NGOs. It is clear that we need collegiality, coordination, and a degree of unity among the majority of the non-governmental organizations. Because we have an international armed conflict since 2014, you see, we have quite a lot uh, NGOs dealing with the issue of international criminal responsibility. All these organizations documenting uh, war crimes, yeah, collecting evidence, and so on and so on. That's why we really need uh, some mechanism to ensure cooperation, as well as mechanism to represent a common position of the Ukrainian NGOs. In Ukraine, after the full-scale invasion, two coalitions of NGOs were established. Uh, Ukraine 5 AM coalition and the Tribunal for Putin initiative. Uh, from one point of view, yeah, you understand that if we have two coalitions, it may be competition between them. Uh, at the same time, uh, uh, currently, these coalitions work together. They uh, provide uh, common conferences, workshops, uh, debates, uh, surveys, uh, and so on and so on in cooperation. At the same time, uh, I see some uh, different approaches between uh, NGOs and between uh, between NGOs within coalitions and between these coalitions. Yeah. So, mm, speaking about uh, the special tribunal, it must be noted that a uh, few organizations insist that we the special tribunal for all international crimes. Uh, some NGOs uh, insist that we need the special tribunal just on the crime of aggression. Yeah, And uh, such uh, tensions, they start to appear, but currently we should recognize that uh, this cooperation is quite effective. And here we have uh, done. Uh, so we have. Uh, the cooperation. Uh, at the same time, you see uh, 5 a.m. and Tribunal for Putin coalition, uh, they are mainly about uh, human rights protection. Even if the second is called the Tribunal for Putin, uh, they speak about international criminal responsibility as a whole. Now, the dialogue with the Ukrainian authorities. The Ukrainian government recognizes the importance of instituting the special tribunal, yet it is equally aware of the potential pitfalls resulting from its failure to do so. So in this situation, a role of NGOs change a little. They do not control a state in its activities, for example, in human rights here, but have Ukraine to insist on the necessity to establish the tribunal. So NGOs and Ukraine are acting together to ensure individual ac accountability for all committed international crimes and not only for uh, some of them. NGOs representatives quite often follow government officials in their abroad trips devoted to ensuring accountability. We consider such level of cooperation as unique but at the same time, it is extremely efficient. But not everything is so great in relations with the Ukrainian government. Yeah, uh, The Ukrainian and the international NGOs invite Ukraine to ratify the Rome Statute, at least from 2014. 
Of course, it is not an issue of the special tribunal since the ICC is not going to get jurisdiction over a crime of aggression uh, in our situation in any case. But it is a very common question. So after all this time, why Ukraine has not, uh, why has Ukraine not ratified the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, even on meetings devoted to the special tribunal? Especially knowing the existence of some sort of competition between the ICC and uh, potential special tribunal. So NGOs try to push uh, the issue of ratification, but uh, here we still have some problems. Other immense challenge is connected with the participation of NGOs in elaborating the special tribunal statute or statutory document, yeah, whenever, whatever it calls. Now we have a core group on special tribunal for Russian crime of aggression, and only state representatives take part in the work of the core group. There is a risk that when, and we insist when, not if, negotiations on the statutory document of the special tribunal would take place, NGOs representatives may not get an invitation to eat. And uh, it will be a serious uh, problem, yeah, because uh, during negotiations, uh, negotiations on the Rome Statute, you know how active uh, NGOs were and uh, how successful they were in um, helping to elaborate uh, the Rome Statute uh, as we know it today. International advocacy efforts. Uh, Holding conferences, seminars, roundtables, briefings, uh, etc., in uh, foreign countries uh, on the need to establish the special tribunals. Yeah, uh, such events allow for direct communication to discuss the possibility and mechanisms of, of establishing a special tribunal, gain political support, shape public opinion, and intensify the work of NGOs in their countries. Yeah, it is clear. Yeah, we all know uh, what is international uh, advocacy about. Uh, the Ukrainian NGOs, international NGOs, uh, they are they have expertise in knowledge and knowledge uh, in the issue of international criminal responsibility and in the dissemination of information. Yeah, what is extremely important, and usually states are not so successful in it. But there is also a challenge. There is a challenge to find uh, themselves yeah, when NGO uh, members, representatives, find themselves in a, a supporter's bubble. Yeah, so when uh, uh, current work on the special tribunal uh, it is mainly a general compromise that we need such special tribunal. We have a discussion in which form, yeah, international tribunal, hybrid tribunal, or based on international treaty, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we have a common uh, understanding on the necessity to prosecute the crime of aggression and the necessity to establish uh, this tribunal. Uh, it seems like, um, you see, you, the Ukrainian NGOs, uh, they participate on the very first level yeah, to prove the necessity to establish, but not uh, in uh, the, um, but do not take participation in the expertise. Yeah, uh, once again, for example, uh, we have core group, yeah, only be, be only uh, consisting of uh, states. And the other challenge is that uh, Ukrainian uh, NGOs uh, uh, sometimes they are called uh, like uh, uh, victims' point of view. Yeah, I do not think that uh, it is a correct uh, approach. Then, Ukrainian and international societies' awareness and attitudes towards the special tribunal. Uh, in democratic states, yeah, political will depends on the will of uh, citizens, yeah, because they are going to vote for this or that party. And Ukrainian NGOs, they try to shape uh, attitude of Ukrainian international societies 
and uh, to disseminate knowledge about the special tribunal. Uh, a challenge in this issue is that uh, some surveys um, are a little um, tricky in its nature. Yeah, because if you uh, simply ask, uh, do you support an establishment of the special tribunal uh, to prosecute Putin? Uh, of course, the majority of people uh, answer yes. Uh, but if you then ask, uh, do you support the special tribunal to prosecute for all international crimes or just for a crime of aggression, uh, people also answer that for all international crimes. Yeah, And uh, from international legal point of view, of course, it means that there is a lack of understanding. And uh, it means that uh, I don't know exactly how to provide uh, enough legal expertise yeah, for ordinary citizens to understand the difference between the crime of aggression, war crimes, uh, and uh, a crime of genocide uh, and crimes against humanity. So uh, here we have uh, a next challenge. And the last, e ju ju just, just a minute, yeah, it is uh, legal work on the establishment uh, of the special tribunal. Yeah. Now we have a lack of it. So the Ukrainian NGOs say that we need the special tribunal. We need the special tribunal to overcome immunity of the head of, of uh, Troy members. Uh, we have to ensure responsibility for all international crimes, but we do not have one exact approach to what this special tribunal should be, uh, on what principles uh, its activity should be based, and so on. So here, uh, you see, I cannot say that NGOs are trying to shape international law. Yeah, they try to insist, they try to prove that we need uh, reshape of international law. But how to do it, it is a serious problem. And I hope that we'll get uh, a possibility to at least to try uh, to guarantee NGOs uh, participation in uh, shaping international criminal law. Uh, that's all uh, that I wanted uh, to mention. Uh, we have a new case. Yeah, and uh, this case uh, may influence further development uh, of uh, international law. And uh, there is one more chance to show that uh, international law may be not only state-centered, yeah, but also non-state actors may play an important role in it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Roman, for that presentation. It sounds like you have a truly fascinating project developing here, and I'm sure there will be a lot of questions from the participants on the theme and on the approach that yourself and your colleague have adopted in researching these efforts to promote the special tribunal. However, before hearing these questions, we will now shift the focus to our two remaining presentations, which are looking at different ways in which NGOs engage with specific areas of international economic law. So here we'll be starting with a presentation by Jean-Michel Massou, who is assistant professor at Carleton University, and who will be presenting a paper entitled NGOs at Uncitral Group 3, a two-fold contestation of ISDS reform. So many thanks for being with us here today, Jean-Michel, and whenever you're ready, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, John. Let me just check if I can share my slides here. Uh, that should be this one. Can you all see the, the slides? Yes, wonderful. Yep, I can see them, uh, thank so, you very much. Thanks, so thank you very much for uh, the kind of introduction and thanks for, uh, very really grateful uh, to, to all the organize, members of the organizing committee for putting this uh, workshop together. Uh, I really enjoyed the first panel, the parallel panel. Unfortunately, I will have to run right after this panel because of teaching commitments, uh, but I, I hope that you will be able to uh, enjoy this very rich team and enjoy the rich conversation about that. Um, I'll position my 
presentation in a very specific portion of international law, which is investor state dispute settlement. I know that the audience has a very broad expertise in international law. So let me just take a step back first and say a few words about international investment law and ISDS, investor state dispute settlement. So states have negotiated a very broad range of international investment agreements in which they do grant some protective standards to a lot of foreign investors. Uh, in addition to these protective standards, there is a procedural right that is often granted to private actors, to foreign investors. So these foreign investors can choose to submit a claim to arbitration if they consider that uh, the host state or the respondent state has failed to uh, live up to its commitments, failed to uh, meet its obligations under international investment law. This mechanism, this dispute settlement mechanism known as ISDS, has uh, become quite uh, contentious, and we're seeing a lot of criticisms that are being vo uh, voiced against ISDS. So <clears throat> issues about lack of legitimacy, uh, the length of proceedings, the cost of proceedings, the absence of uh, consistency or coherence across decisions, as well as high level of monetary damages that have to be paid by states to foreign investors have all been extensively criticized. Now, this brings me to the starting point of this research project. We are, have seen some efforts to actually reform ISDS, and one of these efforts is uh, the uh, was spearheaded by uh, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, UNCITRAL, in 2017. UNCITRAL at that time entrusted Working Group 3 to reform ISDS. It actually asked to operate in three main steps. So first, to identify and consider concerns regarding ISDS. In other words, to map the uh, criticisms that have been voiced against the dispute settlement mechanism. Then there was a, re uh, a request to consider whether reform was desirable and ultimately to develop any relevant solution to reform uh, ISDS. What I want to stress is that this is actually a process that is formally led by states. Members of UNCIT World Working Group 3 are actually government leaders, are states, and they are the ones who will make the decision to reform or not ISDS. Having said that, from the very beginning, the process was extended to a broad range of stakeholders. So we are seeing a lot of states and non-state actors that have chosen to actually participate in the reform process through the submission, uh, through the provision of written submissions. What I'm going to present today is part of a broader research project in which we looked at a corpus of 64 written submissions that were provided by states and non-state actors at UNCITRAL Working Group 3 between uh, 2017 and 2020. We explored the content of these submissions through computational analysis to have a better sense of the broader structure of the reform process, as well as critical discourse analysis. What I want to do today is to narrow down on the critical discourse analysis and explain more specifically the role of INGS in this reform process through uh, the content of their written submissions. And what I really want to highlight here is a twofold contestation of the ISDS reform process uh, advanced by different types of NGOs. So the research question around which I articulated this presentation is the following. How did NGOs contribute to the elaboration of narratives pertaining to reform of ISDS at UNCITRAL Working Group 3? And the main argument that I want to put forward here is that ISDS reform at UNCITRAL Working Group 3 has really emerged as a highly contested normative space. It is not just a reform process where we are seeing some actors, some NGOs that are in favor of the process and others that are against the reform process we are really seeing a twofold contestation that can seriously impede the uh, ultimate legitimacy of the reform process. So I'll proceed in three main parts. First, I'll say a few words about norm contestation as a, a theoretical framework for international relations theory that informs our analysis. And then I'll turn to two main strategies that can be used uh, by norm entrepreneurs and that have been used by NGOs in this specific context. So first, some efforts by some NGOs to undermine the reform process. And second, efforts by other type and other type of NGOs to actually refute the need for reform. Um, so let me say a few words about our uh, theoretical framework. So to a certain extent, this is an interdisciplinary project. We rely on international relations theory uh, to frame a little bit what we want to demonstrate. Uh, norm contestation can be positioned in a 
broader sphere or the broader uh, stream of international relations theories known as constructivism. It is a broad theoretical framework that posits that international norms are socially constructed, and it emphasized the mutual constitution between norms and actors. So on the one hand, international norms will have an impact on the conduct and the behavior of international actors. And on the other end, we're seeing a lot of state and non-state actors being able to actually shape the content of these international norms and, and the implementation of these these international norms. Uh, when we look at the stream of literature in constructivism and international relations theory, uh, we find some work that highlight the role of norm entrepreneurs. These are actors that are actually trying to persuade other actors to adopt new norms. So this type of work really focuses on the life cycle of norms, uh, looking at which actors are actually playing a key role, uh, especially when initiating the whole process uh, to put forward these new international norms. And in addition to this, we have perhaps a more critical uh, stream of literature where we talk about norm entrepreneurs and norm contestations. So the idea here is that there are some norms or some actors that can actually prefer to preserve status quo and that might de devoid or deploy some efforts to actually limit the emergence of these new norms. So a, a two leading authors in constructivism uh, I've uh, argued, and I'm pointing here to a, a, a paper by Martha Finmore and Catherine Sicking in 1998, that new norms never enter into, uh, never enter a normative vacuum, but emerge in a highly contested normative space where they must compete with other norms and perceptions of interest. And in addition to this, I'm referring here to a definition by Alan Bloomfield in a paper that was published in 2016 of norm entrepreneurs, which refer to actors who defend the entrenched status quo against challengers, so against norm entrepreneurs. More specifically, and that's the portion of the theory that is useful for our work here, uh, there are two forms of action or two strategies that can be used by norm entrepreneurs. First, they can seek to undermine the emerging norms, articulating that there are some inherent problems that are not solved by these uh, new norms, and they might also refute the need for new norms. So really trying to preserve status quo, highlighting that there's just no need to address any problems, no need to actually develop new norms. We apply this research, uh, well, this theoretical framework in the research project, uh, basically to uh, highlight the role of uh, norm, uh, of NGOs as a norm entrepreneurs. So just to be clear, there are some states that can be considered as norm entrepreneurs regarding the reform of ISDS. You might be aware of the uh, effort deployed by the European Union to establish a multilateral investment court, so which would differ from the ad hoc tribunals in ISDS. Uh, there are some states that can definitely act as norm entrepreneurs as well. So some states uh, like Brazil, South Africa, that are clearly opposed to ISDS and that have used the ISDS reform process at UNCIT World Working Group 3 to articulate uh, their position. But what I want to focus on here is the existence of two different strategies that have been adopted by two different types of NGOs to really highlight how um, ultimately uh, ISDS reform at UNCIT World Working Group 3 is something that can be considered as a highly contested normative space. So first strategy, we're going to focus on uh, undermining the reform. There are some NGOs that I will refer to as public interest NGOs that have really highlighted the problems underlying the current reform process. So some of these NGOs uh, have a more specific expertise in international investment law. Uh, there's the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment, for example, or CCSI, that is known as a, an organization that, and I quote from their website here, works to strengthen the sustainable development potential of international investment and to ensure that international investment is mutually beneficial for investors and the citizens of recipient countries. Uh, other NGOs do not have a specific expertise in international investment law, but focus on broader themes like the protection of the environment, the, pro the promotion of sustainable development and so forth. So we've seen submissions by NGOs like Lion Earth, for example, an environmental charity that is broadly dedicated to protect life on Earth. Uh, we've seen submissions from think tanks like uh, the International Institute for Sustainable Development and so forth. What I want to stress is that when we look at the narrative and the content of the submissions by these NGOs, we're really seeing efforts to demonstrate 
fundamental issues regarding ISDS and even regarding international investment law that are not fully taken into consideration through the reform process. So here I chose an excerpt from a written submission that was published in May 2018 by CCSI, so the Columbia Center for Sustainable Investment. Basically, what it highlights is that ISDS is not working well and that we should actually use the reform process that has been uh, established or elaborated at UNCIT World Working Group 3 to ask important questions. So we should not actually try to just fix some specific problems, some procedural problems. We should actually have more important discussions about um, what objectives we're trying to achieve with the system, with international investment law as a whole, or uh, and as well as what dispute settlement uh, system is best suited to ad ad for advancing these objectives. So not just talking about the procedural aspects of ISDS, but really highlighting that there are fundamental elements related to international investment law that are not taken into consideration in the reform process. Uh, in addition to it, uh, I wanted to include a, an excerpt of a submission by Public Citizen that really highlighted the fundamental unfairness of ISDS, the fact that it uh, grants a powerful class of interest, extraordinary commercial rights. So what we're seeing here is not just a matter of being in favor or against uh, the reform process. It really is a matter of highlighting how the current reform fails to address these this fundamental unfairness of ISDS and international investment law. In addition to this strategy, there are other NGOs that I'll refer to as uh, NGOs that represent the interests of the arbitration community or perhaps private interest uh, NGOs that have actually participated in the reform process, mostly to refute the need for reform. Uh, before delving into this strategy, I should also mention that we can see some private interest NGOs that have also uh, sought to undermine the reform process and that have used the first strategies, uh, mostly to highlight that there are some uh, problems that have been unforeseen by the promoters and the norm entrepreneur of the uh, reform process. So uh, some organization uh, highlighting problems that we might face with respect to decisions resulting from the multilateral investment court, this would fall mostly in the first category. What I want to focus on here is how some private interest NGOs have really used their uh, submissions in order to refute uh, the need for reform. So again, here I'll focus on some very specific NGOs. There's a group of, uh, there's an NGO that is known as the Corporate Council for International Arbitration Group, CCIAG, that has actively participated at UNCIT World Working Group 3. Uh, it is a, an association of corporate councils from various multinational companies focused on international arbitration and dispute resolution. There is also a think tank uh, known as the European Federation for Investment Law and Arbitration, or EFILA, that has uh, participated in the reform process to a great extent, submitting various uh, written submissions to, uh, to this reform process between 2017 and 2020. Uh, there are some private interest NGOs that have actually uh, demonstrated a form of openness to some form of reform, but very, very narrow uh, possibilities. So the CCIAG that I mentioned before, for example, supported uh, the adoption of a code of conduct for arbitrators or the idea of regulating third-party funding. But most of the time, when these NGOs have participated in the reform process, they have uh, actually refuted the need for reform. And here I wanted to uh, use two excerpts from a submission by EFILA, so the European Federation uh, of International uh, of Investment Law. Uh, basically on the first one, it actually highlights that there's just no problem that is worth focusing on because the debate regarding ISDS is mostly dominated by misrepresentations and negative perceptions against ISDS, not actual facts. And that's kind of the goal of FLA is to provide more specific facts to engage with ISDS reform. And then in the same submission, EFILA considers that ISDS system works and that if we're going to actually reform ISDS, it has to be within the currently existing institutions. So clearly not 
uh, establishing a new multilateral investment court in order to address this issue. So what I want to focus on here is that this type of submissions is not just about uh, being against the reform that is undergoing at UNCIS World Working Group 3. It is really about refuting the clear need for reform, suggesting that ISDS is working well and that there's just no major problem that is worth uh, tackling. So I'll wrap up here very briefly. So what I want to suggest as a whole here is that we have two types of NGOs that are participating in the reform process of ISDS at UNCIT World Working Group 3. This is a government-led process, but NGOs are nevertheless actively participating in it. It is not an instance where there's just one group of NGOs uh, that is in favor of reform and the other that is against the reform. What we are seeing is an clear twofold contestation of ISDS. There are two different strategies that are used by different types of NGOs to actually challenge and contest the reform of ISDS. These NGOs are acting as norm entrepreneurs. And I think that this has a very important impact on the legitimacy of the potential outcome of this reform process. If this reform is challenged and contested by those that have actually pointed before the lack of legitimacy of ISDS, as well as users of ISDS, like corporate councils, for example, uh, this might seriously impact the possibility of any viable solution uh, that could be adopted by states uh, through uh, UNCITOR Working Group 3. So I'll stop here. I'll stop the sharing of my slides, and I'm happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you very much for that, Jean-Michel. That was all very clear. And thank you for the primer on dispute settlement in international investment law as well. As a non-expert, I found that very helpful, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in that respect. We'll, uh, we'll now turn to our final presentation. Uh, so we'll be hearing from uh, Andriy Jarikov, who is a senior lecturer at the University of Plymouth, and who will be presenting a paper entitled The International Chamber of Commerce and its role in the development and harmonization of international trade finance regulation. Thank you for joining us, Andriy. I see, okay, you have your presentation there. That's working well. So whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, John. Um, hope you can see and hear me fine. Uh, just one correction. I'm not from Plymouth. I'm from Portsmouth, but uh, I, uh, that's quite often that I get this confusion. Apologies, so my mistake. No at all. <laughs> um, uh, and I want, as a first thing, I want to thank uh, John, Michelle and Roman for their uh, incredibly uh, deep uh, insights about their topics. That was very useful to hear. I'm consider myself as a specialist in dispute resolution. That's my main specialization. So I really enjoyed that. And uh, uh, I'm also uh, Ukrainian. So it would be, it was very good to hear the developments in relation to uh, involvement of NGOs in uh, um, criminal law. So um, turning down to myself. Uh, so today I'll talk about the International Chamber of Commerce, the ICC, and its role in the development and harmonization of international trade finance regulation. So just to give some uh, background on uh, the ICC, well, it, the organization was established in 1919 uh, with the aim of representing private business in a global policy arena. And at that time, when it was just the end of the First World War, um, there was no real world system of rules to govern trade, investments, and financial or commercial related issues. And in fact, any trade finance documentary instruments were governed solely by banking practices and trade usages. And the ICC assumed respons responsibility for codification of the trade finance customs, practices, and usages, and has been developing these codifications ever since. However, since its establishment, the activities of the organization have significantly broadened in scope and reach. And fast forward to today, the ICC is an institutional representative of around 45 million companies in more than 170 countries, and it's claiming to be the most connected business organization in the world, which is uniquely positioned to ensure that the voice of businesses is heard. For example, uh, in 2016, the ICC became the first uh, private association to become uh, to be granted the status of the observer member of the United Nations, uh, and it uses its arena to promote the interest of business. Now, the ICC has prioritized several areas of its activities, such as alternative dispute resolution, environment, sustainability, and governments, 
digital transformation and innovation and finance trade and investment. And within each of these areas, the ICC has formed specialized working bodies composed of uh, business and industry experts who prepare policy products, uh, including statements to contribute to intergovernmental discussions, as well as the rules and codes to facilitate international business transactions. And it's especially the latter element, the rules and codes, which I'm uh, focusing my presentation on today. So in trade finance, uh, we have the specialized ICC commission, the Banking Commission, which it has issued a number of rules for banks, trade practitioners, lawyers, and courts to interpret trade finance instruments correctly and uniformly. Probably the most well-known among those is the Uniform Customs and Practices for Documentary Credits, otherwise known as UCP, with the latest edition in uh, 2007, um, uh, and it's abbreviated as UCP 600. Now, there are other rules, um, and I give some examples like Uniform Rules for Demand Guarantees, another quite popular trade finance documentary instrument, or the latest Uniform Rules for Digital Trade Transactions, which were just issued in 2021. Um, ICC has been, and its Banking Commission, has been really active in issuing those uh, uniform rules and also codifying the standard banking practice. And you can see that uh, there are rules and practices for virtually every type of documentary trade finance instrument, such as bank payment obligations, collections, bank-to-bank -bank reimbursement, and generally uh, banking practices. So uh, the work of the ICC, the ICC has been really active in this area, and there is... Uh, a really beneficial element to that because currently uh, national international legal regimes they fail to provide for sufficient and consistent trade finance regulation and this is where exactly where icc fits it works into for example uh, in his research in 2016 alavi listed only 14 civil law jurisdictions and the usa as the single example of common law jurisdiction which have any statutory rules regulating the functioning of letters of credit However, even then, if any provisions are actually included in their statutory regulation, they only tend to consist of a few articles of general nature explaining what is the, uh, that letter of credit, what its function, and so on. So there is no substantive regulation. And this is very unsatisfactory and surprising to some extent, because according to the uh, World Trade Organization in its 2016 report, some 80 to 90 percent of all world trade relies on trade finance. Uh, furthermore, the World Bank in 2023 um, calculated that the aggregate annual volume of international trade credit comes to over 40% of world GDP. And that creates this um, unusual situation when we rely on trade finance quite a lot, but unfortunately, there is no legal framework to uh, regulate it at a sufficient level. And furthermore, that results in a number of uh, additional problems. For example, um, because letter uh, document trade finance documentary instruments, they are products of rather merchants from medieval um, era where um, when the trade has been blooming across uh, uh, medieval markets and the merchants had to regulate their activities by themselves because they simply were not states in the uh, current understanding that we have. Um, so these uh, instruments, they have a long history which predate any uh, state regulation and they've been functioning there for quite a while. And when legal practitioners tend to impose uh, our standard legal rules on these instruments, that creates all sorts of problems. And not least, this is because of the lack of understanding how trade finance documentary instruments work. Now, uh, one case which I put here is uh, from England is the Offshore International Essay uh, where the judge um, analyzed uh, the letter of credit transaction, but came up to a completely wrong um, understanding about the roles of the banks in the transaction and what their actions were supposed to be and what are the elements of that transaction. Nonetheless, the judgment was rendered and it served as a foundation for all the subsequent case law uh, uh, for letter of credit transactions, not only in England, but in many other common law jurisdictions. Um, which influenced the way how the instrument uh, was regulated or rather approached by the judiciary in different countries. Now, another common issue with the trade finance documentary instruments that it's 
really uh, difficult in practice to establish the governing law for uh, for that instruments in advance. And it's simply because um, in the course of the transaction, the place of performance may switch several times depending on the actions of the parties involved. One, uh, again, illustrative example of it um, is from England, from Power Kerbal International case, uh, where Lord, Lord Denning decided this case. He actually came up with a, an interesting um, conclusion and acknowledged the unique nature of uh, uh, letters of credit, saying that this is a unique trade finance instrument and it's not supposed to be regulated in the same manner as um, other aspects um, um, in commercial transactions. And it came up, came up with a solution that uh, the governing law of the letter of credit should be at the, uh, at the place of performance. In other words, where the documents presented in exchange of a payment. And this position uh, solidified in English law for more than 35 years. And even in uh, uh, Rome Regulation 1, the, um, it was still represented as one of the exceptions to the general rule of the, com um, of the commercial law that... Uh, the place of performance is where the debtor is resided. However, in 2017, this position, this judgment uh, by Lord Denning was overruled by the Supreme Court in the Taurus Petroleum case. And now uh, we no longer have, have uh, no longer have exception for the letter of credit transactions, and they are treated as any other type of uh, commercial transaction, which creates a lot of problems. Now, this decision has been highly criticized, uh, and it was a, a rather contested decision in terms of uh, um, majority three to two of the Supreme Court judges uh, uh, who decided to overturn the position in Power Kerber, but I'm not going to spend too much time on it. I'm just, the point here is to show that the transaction itself, uh, the documentary credit transaction was the same uh, throughout its all ex uh, entire existence. However, the way how lawyers approach to regulate it changed several times over the course of, uh, well, a limited period of 35, 40 years. So it, despite the fact that transaction remained the same, the regulatory approach has changed. And not least, this is because the lack of understanding of how letters of credit and other type of trade finance documentary instruments work. Now, this is why ICC developed rules and guidelines may not only provide for uniformity, but also fill this vacuum. And in fact, I believe that they can uh, prove to be more useful than just another piece of soft law as per the legal theory. For example, UNCENTRAL, the United Nations Commission on International Trade Law, endorsed most of the ICC developed trade finance rules. And that's the hallmark of their quality and um, which should, in theory, encourage other um, players, other um, uh, decision makers to adopt them on a more regular basis. And not only this, but ICC developed uniform, um, uniform rules have significantly influenced national and international trade finance lawmaking. They often refer to in local statutes cited and applied by courts. Um, some examples uh, include countries where there are some legislative or normative requirements to follow um, UCP, um, such as in the US, or even in the absence of incorporation of its incorporation by the parties, the fact of treating UCP as a governing law of the contract. So instead of just being another piece of soft law, this is now treated as a de facto hard law. Common law judges frequently refer to ICC developed rules to decide trade finance disputes, and in some common law jurisdictions actually go further by suggesting to refer to the ICC developed instruments even if parties simply did not incorporate this. And this is because uh, the logic in, in this saying that, uh, well, UCP and other trade finance instruments, they've been so influential in the world. They've been incorporated in majority of trade finance transactions. So why don't we standardize this system and uh, treat them as, uh, as per the ICC developed uh, uniform rules? Now, uh, just to conclude, um, Clearly, the standing of the ICC as a private body in the global uh, trade finance arena is unique and growing. And the ICC has produced a number of important regulations for the area, which have considerably shaped the trade finance and enhanced uniformity in the field. But not only this, the ICC actually goes even further by supporting tra its developed trade finance framework. It's regularly updating comprehensive international banking practice, it's issuing its own opinions on the matters of practical application of its developed uniform rules, and it actually operates a unique 
dispute resolution platform called DocDex, which is dedicated solely to trade finance disputes without referencing to any national law. So in this regard, ICC um, supports this um, trade finance framework, uniform trade finance framework, and tries to develop it further by shaping international um, legal norms to the extent that it increases harmonization and uniformity in the area. Uh, I think I'm just about to finish in the allocated 15 minutes, so I will be glad to receive any questions. Thank you very much. Yes, perfect timing. Thank you so much for that excellent presentation, Andri. And thank you to all of our panelists for sharing their research with us today. From what I can see, we have pretty much exactly half an hour left for questions. I can't see anything written in the chat at the moment. So I would like to invite all of our participants to ask any questions that they may have to our panelists, either on the specific presentations that we have heard or on any of the broader themes that have emerged across the presentations. Uh, in this respect, I'd also like to uh, emphasize that the panelists themselves are very welcome to ask any questions that they have or to comment on their colleagues' work. So I'll leave this space open and uh, please either message in the chat or you can also raise your hand and I can call on you to ask your question personally. So whatever you prefer. So, Andrea, I see you have a question, if you'd like to kick off. Yes, um, I have a question to Jean-Michel uh, about NGOs. Um, I wonder if there is any push for NGOs representing local communities to be more active uh, participants of the process of uh, reforming the ISDS, uh, because that's one of the main criticisms that ISDS framework now addresses local communities' needs. So I, I just want interested in your views on this. Sure, John, do you want me to answer uh, this directly? Please, yeah, you... yeah, absolutely. Go straight ahead. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank, thank you very much, Henry, for this uh, great uh, question. Um, I'm not aware of any NGOs that uh, expressly represent the interest of you know specific communities, but clearly a lot of the uh, broader you know public interest NGOs that I mentioned, including the uh, CCSI, as definitely endorse uh, this criticism of ISDS and highlighting that. Uh, the voice of local communities is not uh, currently taken fully into consideration in ISDS and that this is a major problem. Uh, this is something that they uh, that we can see in a lot of their uh, of their submissions. I've used only one submission of CCSI for the purpose of this presentation, but CCSI has uh, authored or co-authored, I think, more than seven uh, submissions. And there are a lot of these submissions that are co-authored with uh, uh, international, the International Institute for Sustainable Development, for example, uh, or uh, Client Earth. So we're seeing a broad range of NGOs that are definitely taking into consideration this aspect and putting that forward. Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you very much. Okay, we have another question here from I think, Rigmo. Sorry if I'm getting your name wrong. If you'd like to unmute yourself and, uh, and pose your question. Thank you. Yes, uh, thank you very much for, for very interesting presentations. And this question goes to Jean-Michel. Uh, I mean, I got absolutely fascinated by uh, your method using the critical discourse analysis. Um, I'd, I'd like you just to, to say a little bit about your, your experience of, of working with that in, in the crossover into the legal area, so to speak. Sure, thank you very much. Uh... I should say I'm not a lawyer by training. Uh, I do a lot of things in international law. I'm uh, more like at the intersection between international relations theory and international law. So I, I did a PhD in law, but I, I don't have like the JD or the LLB. So that might explain why I'm a little bit more inclined in using these interdisciplinary approaches. Uh, in terms of the critical discourse analysis, it came out as a a bit as a, a as a need to address some limits of the other method we were using so we decided to use computational analysis as well uh, the idea was really to kind of have a bird's eye view of the whole uh, of all the corpus of submissions we kind of we use a uh, document term frequency analysis automatically counting the terms that are used and a similarity analysis just to see to what extent there are some overlaps between the various submissions. And then as we were presenting the paper in different conferences, we were often got the question about like what there are some limits to do that, right? And we decided that 
using computational analysis does not actually replace a close reading of these submissions. And that's why we decided to use critical discourse analysis. So the way we did that is that then by we, I, I should emphasize the work of two uh, research assistants, uh, one at Carleton University, the other at McGill University, who did a lot of work uh, coding these submissions and looking at recurring themes. Uh, we also asked them to look at any instances where there are inherent relations of power that are put forward. And it has been very instructive to highlight uh, what is it that actually uh, what we can see as emerging narratives in this old process. It's not just a matter of uh, whether or not actors, NGOs, for example, and even for states, we coded also uh, the submissions for states. Uh, the idea was really to look at what, what are the narratives that are emerging. And using this is really what allowed us to identify this emergence of a, a two, this emergence of a twofold contestation. So I'm, it's not a, was was not the first time that I was using critical discourse analysis. It's something that I think has a lot of value, especially in looking at the negotiation of specific international norms, looking also at the implementation of norms. In the past, I used that with uh, some individuals who were involved in the elaboration, for example, of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights. I think it's it's a method that uh, is definitely useful and that can bring a lot of value in our. Uh, understanding of how law is actually negotiated and how law is implemented. Am I? Does that make sense in terms of your uh, question? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, no, it, I mean, I did my PhD, um, well, 11 years ago, and I, I came, so to speak, from the media uh, research area. So I'd been working on discourse analysis, but then when I crossed over into into law, um, I, I couldn't bring the method with me at the time, you know, so that's why I got so excited to see that <laughs> it still should be possible, you know, and, and as you explained, it, enriching, right? <laughs> I, hopefully there will be more cross uh, fertilization yeah. Uh, yeah. between disciplines, absolutely. Yeah. There was, if, if I may hang on to this a little bit, I've been looking at a few cases from the European Court of Human Rights and, and I'm not into trade law or anything like that. So I'm purely into human rights and possibly crossover into um, IHL. Um, but but there seems to be an indication um, that, that the European Court of Human Rights starts looking into context. It comes in through the rule of law narrative, right? Um, and that's when I started thinking about critical discourse analysis again. You know, is, is that something we should, yeah, consider a bit more. Absolutely. I mean, seeing this as a as a method for judicial interpretation is uh, is quite far, I think, but definitely something as far as research is is concerned, uh, it adds value. And hopefully, if some if some tribunals and courts are doing this, then I'll be a very happy researcher. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you ever so much. <laughs> Thank you so much for that question and for that response, Jean-Michel. Um, I've seen that we have a question in the chat for Roman, so I'll just quickly read this out so everyone knows what it's about. So it says, thank you very much for the question. Uh, two questions for, for Roman. Thank you very much for the presentation. Sorry, two questions for Roman. The first is, have Ukrainian NGOs been talking to any foreign gov governments or international organizations to garner their support in establishing the special tribunal? That's the first question. And the second question was, how would the work of the special tribunal impact on the operations of the ICC? Do you envisage the need for them to coordinate their work? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, <clears throat> about the first one, uh, you see, we have uh, an NGO uh, who won uh, the Nobel Peace Prize yeah, uh, last year, uh, Center for Civil uh, Liberties, and uh, it really helps. Uh, to coordinate uh, support and, uh, of course, uh, you see, quite interesting, but it also influences international law, what also should be mentioned and, I guess, uh, analyzed. Uh, then, uh, cooperation with foreign governments, it is mainly in the form of uh, providing grants uh, and uh, funds uh, to the Ukrainian NGOs. Uh, it is a reality, yes, yeah, so we have uh, a problem uh, with it uh, and uh, cooperation with foreign governments mainly is based uh, on this topic. Uh, but once again, mainly with uh, uh, states uh, who support uh, Ukraine. Uh, 
and uh, it is a serious problem uh, as I understand and as I see it. Uh, with international organizations, of course, with the United Nations, the Council of Europe, the European Union, uh, once again, uh, the Ukrainian NGOs try to use every possibility to promote uh, the idea of the special tribunal. But once again, uh, speaking in a complex of uh, ensuring accountability, uh, at one moment, it should be changed. Yeah, because uh, you see even your next question yeah, about connection uh, between the special tribunal and the ICC says that we have to separate uh, these uh, two issues and to say that we really need uh, international accountability for all international crimes and for the Ukrainian society, it would not be enough if Putin is prosecuted, for example, ju just for war crimes, yeah, as uh, the ICC currently proposes. So, yeah, uh, they have uh, a lot of cooperation, and uh, but at the same time, you see, mm, there is such a strong connection between the NGOs and a state of Ukraine in this issue that sometimes uh, NGOs really do what a state should do. Yeah, so I'm not sure that state delegated uh, such functions to the NGOs, but once again, uh, it is a current reality and it is really interesting to research it uh, to what result uh, would it bring us. Uh, about the second question, uh, the ICC and the Special Tribunal. Of course, uh, very, very, very difficult question. Uh, of course, we need uh, coordination, we need cooperation, because let's hope that uh, in the nearest future, the ICC will have uh, jurisdiction over the majority of crimes of aggression. Yeah, that states will join uh, to the Kampala amendments, uh, that uh, no permanent members uh, of uh, the Security Council uh, of the United Nations will commit uh, crimes uh, of uh, aggression. And let's hope that uh, one day we'll have a situation uh, when uh, the ICC. So let's hope that it would not be crimes of aggression. Yeah, but uh, from a legal point of view, that one day uh, the ICC will have a general jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Till now, yeah, when uh, we do not have enough practice. Uh, of course, we need knowledge of the ICC, we need expertise of the ICC, we need, uh, uh, I don't know, a model of the office, uh, of the prosecutor's office yeah, in the special tribunal. And uh, the special tribunal cannot e exist in vacuum. Yeah, it should be implemented into the current uh, structure of <laughs> international uh, criminal uh, bodies. But how to do it? Yeah, it's uh, a serious question. And uh, I'm not sure that the angels yeah, will play the vital role uh, in this process because um, we have a serious oppression. Yeah, so Ukraine is not going to agree on the hybrid tribunal because we have quite a lot of problems uh, with overcoming impun immunity. Mm what means impunity, yeah, uh, with the provisions of our domestic law, which prohibits uh, establishing of special courts, and so on and so on. So we need cooperation. But once again, it is an issue of financing. Yeah, the ICC says that uh, I have enough jurisdiction and it is better to finance me than not to, and not to finance the establishment of the special tribunal. A lot of issues, not very legal, you see, at this very stage, but they have a strong connection with international law. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for that question and, and for your answer, Roman. Um, are there any further questions, either from the presenters or, yep, I see Jean-Michel raised his hand. Please go ahead. I do have a question to uh, Andrew. So uh, thank you very much, Andrew, for the uh, 
uh, presentation, I find it fascinating to look at the work of non-state actors and how they can actually end up uh, creating some uh, more. Uh, well, sorry, I think we're to the background. Sorry, if we can all make sure that we're muted, please. Thank you. Uh, sorry. Go ahead. Sorry for the yeah, interruption. Okay, wonderful. Uh, so yeah, fascinating work on looking at how non-state actors can create binding norms. Uh, and I, I was wondering to what extent we can, you, you kind of concluded your presentation really focusing on the uh, practice of courts, domestic courts, and how they kind of really reinforce this bindingness of these initiatives from the ICC. And I was wondering to what extent we can actually kind of apportion between the initiative themselves and the subsequent practice of courts. So the fact that we, we're seeing this binding nature and the fact we can see the shift from soft law to hard law in these ICC initiatives, is it something that is within the norm itself, within the initiative, or that depends upon the subsequent practice uh, by other international actors? Oh, thanks for the question. Um, I think it's rather the latter one. Um, I don't think ICC ever envisaged that their developed uh, rules and practices would have an effect of uh, hard law per se, but uh, I, I, from what I've seen, from what um, the positions of ICC have, have been, they're actually delighted that it's taken on board by uh, different countries, especially the courts where the majority of businesses had problems in proving their position uh, because courts, judges are simply not trained in business or economics. They are trying to impose their legal understanding on something external um, which uh, has not really been regulated anywhere. So um, I don't think ICC ever envisaged that it will be hard law, but uh, the issue is um, in many jurisdictions, um, the judges take a more proactive approach simply because there is nothing else to refer to. If the judge is facing with the situation to resolve a case without any uh, legal regulation, any legal norms, the only way to deal with this is to look at soft law uh, available. And uh, I think that's just out of the necessity, uh, not because the judges really want to find some uniformity. I, I hope that answers your question. But uh, basically, I don't think ICC ever envisaged that uh, their developed rules would have a form of hard law. Absolutely. Thank you very much. Okay, fantastic. Thank you both. Do we have any further questions? If not, I may abuse my position as chair to ask a question to Roman, if possible, uh, about one of the points you made about NGOs shaping public attitudes. I thought this was a very interesting part of your presentation, I guess also goes back maybe indirectly to a bit what Andri was saying about uh, or Andy's question to Jean-Michel about representing local communities in the context of investor state dispute settlement as well. And I was wondering if you could maybe expand a bit on that. Um, so not just engaging with states and international institutions, but also trying to garner support amongst the wider public and what you may have, have learned about this so far. I know the investigations at its preliminary stages, but this is something that, that piqued my interest. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, John. Uh, so as for me, yeah, so current international law changes and uh, current international law depends more and more on uh, ordinary citizens. Yeah, so in Ukraine, we really can feel it. Yeah, because after COVID-19, yeah, everyone was... Uh, uh, specialist in infectious diseases yeah and uh, during international armed conflict everyone uh, becomes expert in international law international relations uh, and so on uh, including international cr criminal law and international humanitarian law uh, International law doesn't seem for me to be just a thing for few experts, few specialists or government officials. Yeah, international law becomes a reality for each of us. Since the world becomes smaller and smaller because of uh, globalization. Uh, and uh, so let, let's imagine the situation 30 or 40 years ago. Yeah, wars, they were not online as the uh, current uh, Russian-Ukrainian war. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, grave breaches of international humanitarian law, war crimes, uh, they uh, make uh, a will 
to guarantee uh, overcoming uh, impunity, yeah, to ensure accountability and uh, so on. But uh, societies usually do not know how international law works uh, and how long usually it takes uh, for international law to get uh, some uh, result uh, or to guarantee its uh, efficiency. Uh, and NGOs, uh, at least, they have to explain that there are no quick answers, but please do believe in international law, do believe in possibility to ensure accountability. Uh, NGOs may show that they are doing something, that uh, something is happening, that states are still willing yeah, to prosecute international crimes and so on and so on. Uh, how to find um, this balance? Yeah, because lack of understanding of international law and uh, a great idea to make it uh, efficient, um, I'm not sure exactly. Yeah, you see, in Ukraine, I feel uh, I'm really afraid that one day uh, in, uh, the Ukrainian society will um, um, lose their belief uh, in international law. And uh, it will be a serious problem for all Ukrainian international lawyers and the international international lawyers, yeah, because uh, when 30 millions of people do not believe in international law anymore, it may bring us to a terrible situation. Uh, and uh, how to deal with it? I think that really NGOs may help because uh, to NGOs, uh, we have a, a better attitude than to a state usually, yeah, because the state, uh, it is policy, it is uh, interests of politicians and so on. NGOs are interested in human rights. And uh, through uh, this point of view, yeah, it may be a little more confidence in what NGOs say than uh, states say. So to try to use uh, such way to influence yeah, society's awareness, yeah, society's point of view. Because really, it is not a problem in our societies, yeah, in British society, in the Ukrainian society, in any other European society, maybe in Slovak uh, society, there is a problem in Hungarian, but uh, what to do with other societies, yeah, how to make them uh, believe uh, in international law. It is a more general and the more important question, and the NGOs can really help in it. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much for your response. Um, we have about eight minutes left on this panel, so we can probably fit in one last question if anyone has anything else that they would like to ask. Otherwise, we can also end the session a few minutes earlier if there are no further questions. I think the next one would be the next parallel session starts at 3.45 uh, UK time. So in about 20 minutes or so. So you can also enjoy a, a slightly longer break. Okay, I think I'll assume on that basis that people are ready for a break. Um, thank you, a huge thank you to all of our speakers on this panel for all of the fascinating research that they've shared with us. To Andri, Jean-Michel and Roman, very much appreciate your time and for, for sharing these insights with all of us. And thank you very much to all of our participants for engaging with those discussions and for their questions. I think now that I'm not quite sure how it will work in terms of moving to the next, uh, to the next parallel discussion, but I think if you leave the breakout room maybe, or do we know how this works? Sorry. That, that's what we did in the last session. So when we leave the breakout, we go back to main room and then we can go into the next ones. Perfect. Great. Thanks a lot for that. And thank you again to all of you for your for your participation. We really appreciate it. Enjoy the rest of the workshop. Thank yeah, you, thank you everyone.